Hi everyone, welcome to worship. In our in-person worship here at Newton Park uh, this week, we are incorporating our AGM, or to use a Methodist language, our annual society meeting, we're incorporating it into our Sunday worship. So I've not prepared a usual sermon, and all I'm doing is I'm extricating a few thoughts out of some of the other things I'm saying in the course of worship on Sunday. And today, of course, is the first Sunday in Lent. We've just had Ash Wednesday. And the first scripture reading for Lent is the story of the temptation of Jesus. And I'd like to read it to you. And then I want to make three very quick observations um, out of that passage. From Matthew 4, we read, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. So just briefly, uh, three quick thoughts, and obviously it's a deeply rich passage, so just three quick thoughts, uh, and as I said, that emerged for me as part of our conversation in our AGM this week. The first temptation, the one about stones and bread, the, the real underlying question, the thing, the temptation, the thing that the, Satan's trying to challenge Jesus about is like, who do you believe gives you your bread? Who provides? Who's the bread provider? provider? Satan says to Jesus, why don't you use your powers as the son of God to make some for yourself? Do a trick. Turn some stones into bread. And Jesus says, uh-uh. my whole life depends on God. We need bread. We all need bread, but we need God even more. And so as we as a faith community move into a new year or continue in this new year, I pray that we will open our lives more deeply to the power of God. Um, It is so easy, for me it is, perhaps for you, it is so easy to try to solve problems in our own strength. It's not that we shouldn't use our own strength, but it is tempting to exclude God from these things, to do it on our own. And I pray that we as a church community will learn to become deeply reliant on God and to learn the language and the practice of being dependent on God. It doesn't exclude our responsibility, but to really learn the language of going, my whole life depends on God. In the second temptation, Satan tries to persuade Jesus to participate, if you like, in a game of miracles. Jump off the building and see the angels catch you. I mean, you've got the ability, so go do it. But God is never about games and spectacles. It's interesting how often that comes up in, in the story of the church. How many preachers there have been who have tried to sell God on the basis of games and spectacles. But God is not in those great... Of course, they're in the Bible every now and then. We come across them and they're fantastic. They make wonderful Sunday school stories. But that's not where most of the work happens. Most of the story of God is found in consistent faithfulness. Consistent faithfulness. So our church community, for example, we might have had some high points, but on the whole... Uh, and I know some of these people, and I've heard stories of those who we have before me, but our, our church community, as I'm sure it is true of most church communities, our community is built not on spectacle, not on the fanciful. Our church community is built, uh, is built on faithfulness. And we are inheritors, as the current community of faith, we are inheritors 
of the Christ-like sacrificial faithfulness of those who have gone before us. So as a church community, fleshy we may not be, but faithful I'm so grateful to say we are. And may God keep us faithful, and may we find more faithful people amongst us. I do want to interject, as you often hear me say, I do think that what COVID has done is it has revealed, it has exposed faithfulness, and I don't want to call it unfaithfulness, but lack of faithfulness. Um, The way of God is faithfulness. The way of the devil is I'll come for the game, I'll come for the spectacle, I'll come for the show. And then the third temptation, Satan offers Jesus, really, I suppose, what you could call political power. I'll give all of this to you, says Satan. And I'm not being cynical when I say this at all. I will be tempted to think I am, but I'm not being cynical when I say to you, it's not a big leap for us to believe that Satan is involved in politics. You can believe. You can believe that within the political realm, as necessary as it is for human existence, uh, that there's lots of room there for Satan. And when Satan tries to tempt Jesus with worldly power, Jesus' response is a call to worship. Um, it's, a, it's a call to say, um, yeah, that's when Jesus says, go away, Satan. Because he goes, there's only one whom we worship. We don't worship anything or anyone else. We only worship God. And again, if I can say, that in this post-COVID world, I'm still trying to work out, and I think we as a church are still trying to work out, I wonder why it is that corporate worship has been abandoned by quite so many, why corporate worship has been so easily relinquished. How do we give up something that is quite so important, that is quite so significant? I wonder wonder what that is. Because worship is the center of our faith. It is in worship that we are reminded that Jesus is Lord and that we are not. That this is not about what we want or don't want, it's about what Jesus wants. It's in worship that we surrender our pride and that we bow down. Those of us, those of us who live largely affluent lives, we seldom bow down to anyone. Um, those in need sometimes bow down if they want something, but we who have, we seldom bow down. And at least once a week, Worship is a place for us to remind ourselves that we need to bow down. In our, uh, in our Ash Wednesday service this week, we created a moment in the liturgy to say, just pause and bow your head. Like, be conscious of bowing down. Uh, it's important. It's important that we gather to bow down. In worship, it ceases. Our lives cease to be about us, and they become about God. Our focus moves off of us and moves on to who God is. And then when we, have, when we have rightly oriented ourselves, we can then focus on others and about sharing life with others and about being a gift to others, about blessing those around us in worship. And then, by the mercy and grace of God, perhaps, we are able to be blessed ourselves. But worship is a wonderful correction to our self-centered lives. And in worship, our minds are washed in the loveliness and the truth of God. In worship, we are able to confront our guilt and we are able to find forgiveness. In worship, the ritual of giving an offering every week is not, not, we, we we don't like to call it the collection in our church. We want to call it an offering because this, because that moment isn't just to collect money. It's about inviting us to challenge, again, our selfishness and to make an offering, to surrender ourselves and surrender our wallets, if you like. The truth is, everything we need for godly living, all the habits that we need for godly living are modeled for us in the act of worshipping together. It's the lifeline. It's the lifeline for those who follow Jesus. Like those underwater sea divers in, of old who didn't take scuba gear with them, but they had the big hose pipe, if you like, that went back up to the ship. Worship's our hose pipe. Worship is our scuba gear. It's our lifeline. It's the thing that keeps us attached when we want to drift away. So I, I hear the call in the temptations of Jesus. Remain, remain faithful in worship. Depend on God. 
be a faithful follower, be someone upon whom God's people can depend and who helps build his church and be faithful in worship, uh, your lifeline for a life with God. God bless you wherever you may be watching and to whichever community you belong and perhaps if you don't belong to a community, maybe you want to find one, but God bless you. And again, I thank you for your faithfulness in sharing this journey with us. Go well.